We're honored to be here. You're one of the few people in the world who can pick up the phone. You can call any sovereign, any CEO, any sector. You operate at a whole different level. Tell my daughters that. They're, they're watching this on live stream. Um, thank you so much, Mike. I'm so honored to be here. This is my first interview in this new role. Uh, and I'm so proud of Jack. It is it, He is the pride and joy of Pittsburgh. Go Pittsburgh. Um, and you know, what's interesting about what he just talked about is how we are seeing this really important concept around artificial intelligence, which is that it's a group sport. And what I mean by that is you can't accomplish it without the energy that's required, without all of the hyperscalers coming together, without governments. And that's what happened in the Pittsburgh summit. Uh, we had the CEOs of many of those institutions gather together and see how they can work together to actually advance uh, these goals. Yeah, and what's fascinating about this, and you really see this reflected in Axios coverage, Axios Local now in 34 cities around the country, that in this new age, like all power doesn't rest in, no offense, Menlo Park or in Washington or New York, it's in the Pittsburghs of America. Because that's where, obviously, the fundamental compute is being built across the country. Uh, you know, at our summit, uh, it was really wild to see Larry Fink and Mike Berg, who represents the construction workers, the welders, the electricians, come together and actually agree that this new phase of uh, compute is going to require 500,000 electricians in the country. Just think about these new jobs that are being created uh, in cities, uh, frankly, Mike, that had been losing jobs for so long, and also new sources of energy. Um, Joel Kaplan is here uh, with Meta, my friend, and he actually announced one of the largest nuclear investments that Meta has ever made. And so you really are seeing this combination of energy, new sources of workforce, which is really important. And of course, that's important because there's a little bit of worry out there. What is AI going to do to jobs across the country? Interestingly enough, I think that there is going to be a new generation of jobs created as well. If I'm a Pittsburgh or a Des Moines or a pick your city across the country. How should I be thinking about AI and the opportunity? It's, it, it's interesting because um, here we are in Davos and we're talking about sovereigns and sovereign investments and countries really competing with each other. You know, there's all this talk about the race between China and the U.S. and AI and the Middle East investments. But what I think people haven't caught on to quite yet is what I would call the intra-state fighting. And so after that summit, we got a call from our friend Governor Sarah Huckabee Sanders. Why not Arkansas? Um, you know, Texas is competing. All these cities are. And I can say that uh, it's actually, I think, helping cities highlight the assets that they have. There's obviously some fundamentals you have to have. You have to have water. You have to have a lot of land. You have to honestly have deregulatory policies. Uh, but you also have, have to have amazing institutions. In Pittsburgh, we have Carnegie Mellon. We have a history of having extraordinary engineers. And so um, I do think there's a little bit of every state's chamber of commerce kind of starting to make the case for why they should be selected for these massive investments in data setters and, and, and other investments. Do you know one of our topics today is impact investing, and you have both expertise and experience in this. How business can work with philanthropies and uh, invest in a smart, wise way. Alex Taylor, who's here, is very uh, uh, passionate about conservation, and how can companies use their resources of different types to help conservation, other philanthropies, how can they be as, sm as smart about that as they are about their own balance sheets? Well, I think it's um, taking kind of the assets back to that that you have and really thinking about your convening power and, and all of the things that you uniquely have to make impact. When I worked at Goldman, we obviously were very focused on economic development through 10,000 women, 10,000 small businesses, because that was kind of inherent in the strategy that we had and what we knew. Uh, I think today, small business is still uh, something that really matters across the industrial sector. Uh, first of all, they power the jobs in the United States. Uh, more and more use of AI, I think, is making them uh, stronger, better, more focused, frankly, on things that they are, there were gaps in, like cybersecurity and, and other things. Um, and I also do think how we think about um, these investments, massive investments across 
communities and being very careful to not upend those communities, but to respect and listen to local residents. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg last week when he announced uh, my role also announced something called MetaCompute, which is a group within the company that's really going to be thinking about the capital that is it's going to require many hundreds of billions of dollars uh, for uh, the ambition that, that he has and the communities in which we're working to really be thoughtful about those investments city by city, respecting the local governments and really working hand in hand. And my dream will be to maybe be able to say one day that small business are the builders of data centers across the country. And you also worked with 10,000 women at Goldman Sachs. What does that success of that program tell you about the shape of business in America and the world today? Women are the secret sauce. <laughs> How about that? Um, no, actually, I do think the growth, particularly in female entrepreneurship, I was just on a panel with um, His Excellence Khaled El Falah, the investment minister in Saudi Arabia. And when you think about the change that's happened in the last decade in the kingdom, uh, and obviously um, not always a straight line when you're doing massive reform of that scale, but what has been fascinating that in every one of the pillars of Vision 2030, women really are a huge part of the growing work workforce, um, of the growing education base, but most importantly, there are more and more female entrepreneurs creating startups in Saudi Arabia. Think of the power of that message. Think of how much uh, they will enhance the economy and think of the role models that they will be for their daughters. Okay, so last question on impact investing. Say I'm a CEO saying I'm a fly fisherman uh, or a fly uh, fisher uh, fan. Like, what can I do to be smart about how I can promote conservation, promote sustain sustainability, because something I've been chatting about with people here is businesses in the past have not brought the same rigor or even milestones to their philanthropic work that they have to their day job. Well, I think, you know, measurement and transparency reporting on it. You know, I think that certainly in the times that, uh, that I worked on the, the uh, economic development programs that we had, Every single year, we were really transparent. You know, how many business owners went through the program? How much revenue did they create or what percentage? How many jobs were created? And most importantly, what were the failures? What didn't work in the programs? I think it is really valuable, honestly, maybe more valuable than anything when you explain when you're on a philanthropic mission like Alex's to really talk about what hasn't worked. I think people are particularly gun shy to talk about that when it comes to giving money away or to impact because it might dry up your sources or grants. But the truth is I think it makes you look like you're thinking like a business person and every year a business has uh, you know profit and loss losses and so to really talk through that and I always used to say to some of the people in the program that you don't get to be Jack and create Gecko. You don't get to be Alex Cox. You don't get to be Mike Allen or Jim Vandehei without having ups and downs and failures along the way because failure is the thing that happens right before success. And I think being more honest about that, whether it comes to business, philanthropy, or maybe even government someday. <laughs> uh, it's a great, uh, great advice. So, Madam President, day one, uh, a week ago yesterday, you showed up in Menlo Park. You're in a new role uh, uh, reporting to Mark Zuckerberg. How did this role come about, and how did you decide that this was the moment to, you've always been fluent in tech, going back to your time on the Goldman Sachs uh, operating committee. We first knew each other, and Joel Kaplan under President George W. Bush, 43, when you were very young, director of presidential uh, personnel. Um, how did this job come about, and why now? So I have been on the board. I've had the privilege of being on the Meta board um, for the last year. And so obviously it gave me a front row seat to the the products, to the team, uh, to the technology. And I really was just so incredibly impressed. I was also really impressed with Mark's leadership. Um, Mark really uses the board. Uh, he brings challenges to the boardroom and really goes back and forth with board members. That's the kind of leader you want to work with. Uh, you know, you really want to be able to add value, to use your voice, and to actually have someone that you feel is listening to you. So I had, you know, kind of that base. And then just kind of thinking about the uh, team around Mark, who's been together for 20 years, um, most of that core team, and how exciting it is to, to be around them and to frankly be part of, and this is the main thing I told my daughters when they said, you're going to do what? Um, I said, I really believe that um, as human beings today, and Axios, I do think, has been on the front lines of reporting on AI for the last three years. Why? 
because of what I also told my daughters. There is a transformation in humanity coming. Nothing can stop that now with this technology. And to even be a tiny part of that with a company that I admire as much as Meta um, is just truly a huge honor. The only problem is that Kate and Ava in particular, my, my daughters, uh, said to me, you don't have any cool clothes to wear to Menlo Park. You only have black banker suits. And so you're going to have to find some cool jeans and T-shirts. I'm working on it. They're going to spruce you up, as my mother uh, would say. Um, you mentioned uh, the changing face of humanity, and that's kind of a fresh way to say it. Like, we, we run out of ways to say this is bigger than fire. It's bigger than the printing press. When you talk about the face of humanity changing, how did you come to that formulation? And what should we be thinking about in the year ahead and uh, for your kids, our kids? Well, I mean, I think it's it's sort of what we have come now to accept that something big is happening, that it's it's going to change the way we work. It's going to change the way we live. It's going to even have massive implications on national security and warfare, as we're even watching in Ukraine, for example. Um, but I do think it's going to have to be human beings who are careful with this technology and human beings who are responsible in guiding it so that the, the face actually turns to a better, more productive and peaceful uh, life for as many people on this planet as possible. And I, and I think that's going to have to require a lot of care. And I also recognize that's why people are very, very concerned. And that we're probably going to hear a lot more concern until we start to you know, have a balance of what this means. So I think putting humanity in every sentence when we talk about artificial intelligence is going to be increasingly important for every leader that has a role to play in this space. You're one of the few people in corporate and public life where no last name is required, uh, let alone let alone two. Uh, uh, first name, you're universally known. That gives you incredible power platform. How do you plan to use that across the tech industry beyond your role at Meta? How do you hope to use that role as a force multiplier in the industry? Well, first of all, Day eight, um, what I can tell you is it is it is really an honor, and I'm really proud to be part of this meta team. And Joel and I and uh, many of the leaders have been kind of joined at the hip already. And obviously, we talked to our you know partners across the board. Um, Ruth Porat is hosting an amazing breakfast Wednesday here to really talk about um, certain elements, things that I was just describing about how important it is for all of us to be responsible, for all of us in the industry to work together. Of course, we're going to compete. Um, but when it comes to the core values that we're espousing and the core values that are really important for these technologies um, to be safe, to be productive, to hopefully, again, work for uh, towards a more prosperous and peaceful world, as corny as that sounds, it's really possible. I mean, that's how crazy and large uh, these technologies are that artificial intelligence is. So I already know that my friends and other companies are really eager to partner together with us. Uh, to partner with you on... I mean, I think, you know, obviously, Joel, I don't want to get in trouble with Joel, <laughs> but, um, you know, things things like how we should be uh, working together as an industry when it comes to smart regulations, when it comes to, um, you know, use of energy. Um, you've heard a lot about that, and that's why I was so proud this week that we uh, announced, I think we're going to be um, a company that uses nuclear energy in a massively dramatic and, and we hope, responsible way. But I think, wouldn't it be great if, industry-wide, where we didn't need to compete, we actually kind of came together and found ways to have some common values. At Axios Newsletters, Axios uh, Live events, we always end with one fun thing. So as part of your daughter's efforts to spruce you up, um, what are your favorite meta classes? Well, thank you for asking, <laughs> Mike. <laughs> These are Ray-Ban Meta glasses, and they are so cool, and I love them. Um, and I have to tell you, it, they are unbelievable. You can run in them, walk in them. Um, there's so much usage, uh, but now are, there are so many styles. So I, these are approved by my daughters because they knew I was going to be on stage. And um, I secretly have already uh, bought a pair for Jim and Mike, which are the Oakley glasses. When you're fly fishing, when he's running, you're going to look like a stud and you're going to, and this is important, you're going to actually, instead of be on your screen, more and more, these wearables are going to make you part of the world. Alex finds it impossible to believe that I could have even better vision <laughs> at the river. Um, but, uh, 
so uh, Jim wants to know if those are available in readers. <laughs> I'm, I'm like really don't want to be fired on day eight. So um, I, will f I will bring that back. Ashley Zandy will look that up for you. Oh, wait, Joel says yes. Yes, they are. Yay, okay, we are. they are available in readers. <laughs> Uh, thank you to Alex Taylor and all of Axios who has made these events uh, possible. Uh, thank Joel, uh, the Meta team, and Madam President, only one name required, Dina Powell. Thank you for thank joining. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it so much.